I, uh, I, I got a got a hold of one of these small things here, so uh, so that I could sort of fumble around a little bit more on stage. Sort of being the proverbial raisin in the hot dog end, I suppose that it's uh, it's it's uh, you know I, I need to sort of keep your your head moving so that you're not uh, falling completely asleep. Hopefully, I can entertain you beyond that as well. I'm Jacob. I'm the CEO of a company and also the co-founder of a company called Well Today Mesh Makes. Yesterday it was called Mesh Energy, so we changed our name and uh, perhaps. Uh, Perhaps this presentation will give you a bit of an idea of uh, why we did that. Well, so in MESH, what we've been trying to do is figure out uh, some of the answers to the questions that have been set forth by, among others, the IPCC. So we have a target which is uh, minus one and a half, sorry, plus one and a half degrees, sorry, not minus one and a half, that would be great, wouldn't it? Uh, but uh, in meeting that target, if you ask the IPCC, they'll say something to the effect of, well, let's try to uh, let's try to uh, get as many efficiency gains as we possibly can. And then, after we've done that, let's try to see if we can just st start sucking CO2 out of the air, popping it into the ground, pumping it into old, or old oil reservoirs, stuff like that. Well, so our analysis and our point of departure in MASH Energy, or oh, sorry, not MASH Energy today, where MASH makes, is that, uh, well, that's not, that's not good enough. For this to work, for us to actually meet the targets, we need to have energy become CO2 negative, or GHG negative, if you will. And what we've been doing in MASH is thinking really hard about how that could be achieved. And we think we have a really good solution. And, and by the way, I should just state, full disclosure, I'm an engineer, so I love the technical stuff. But I would say that the really interesting thing about our platform is not really the technical stuff. Don't get me wrong, it's interesting, and there will be a slide on it for all of those who, who, are, who are expecting that. But What's interesting in MESH is really that we found out that if you combine the energy element with a sequestration element that is built in, so we're talking about the same, same process, the same underlying model, well, what you can actually do is pave the way for scaling of an energy platform by way of actually sequestering carbon. And if that sounds a little bit cryptic, I hopefully will be able to explain that to you now. And here's the technical slide. Well, oh, didn't come. Oh, sorry, no, that's actually in the next one. Um, what the, way, the place where emissions come from is, of course, energy. There was a really good slide on that a bit earlier, I think, actually, in the previous presentation. Um, but it also comes from residues rotting on the fields in agricultural contexts. So if you go to a country like India, we're actually an Indo-Danish company. So what that means is that we have as many employees in India as we have in Denmark. And uh, one of my colleagues, Rohit, who's here, and a lot of you have met Rohit virtually, is also from India. In India, the way the things work is that you take, uh, you have, let's say, a sugarcane field. You harvest the sugarcane, and after you've harvested the cane, about 70% of you know, what was grown is actually left on the field. That's sort of in the way of the next round of crops. So what you do then is you burn it. And if you've been to an Indian city, I have this sort of romantic view of the sun when you land in Delhi, in the airport of Delhi. You can see this sort of beautiful red sun. Well, it's, it is beautiful, but it's because of massive, massive air pollution. In fact, the average Indian's life is reduced by, or the life expectancy is reduced by something like five years because of this air pollution. And that air pollution is not caused by the cars, it is not caused by the buses, it is not caused by stuff like that, it is caused by the burning of crops on the fields. And what we found out is that we could address this problem while at the same time implementing this model that I just talked about. And we do it by way of, and here it is, here she is, this machine. Uh, believe it or not, this is a, a small modular machine. It doesn't look like it on the picture, I get that. But actually, this whole thing, or a lot of it, is supposed to be squeezed into a container. This is a machine that's called a pyrolysis reactor. A pyrolysis reactor takes stuff, biomass residues, uh, invasive plant species, sewage sludge, stuff like that, and it heats it up to a high temperature in the absence of oxygen. When you do that, well, you get some gas out that can be used for many interesting purposes, and you get another product which is called biochar. And it's really in this combination of having this energy-rich gas and the biochar that our model really makes sense. So uh, the cool thing is that if we combust the gas, we actually can produce electricity from it. And the biochar, well, has a lot of really cool effects. Well, so first of all, um, we're taking the crop residue, and by putting it into this machine, we're valorizing it, both in the biochar direction and in the uh, energy direction. 
Um, but also the biochar, what we've done now is something that would have been left on the field to rot has now been turned into a very, very stable form of carbon. In fact, sort of the mean residence time for biochar, sorry, the half-life for biochar in a, in a, like a default soil type would be something like half a millennium. So that means that when we're taking this biochar and putting it into the soil, it'll stay there, or at least half of it will stay there for more than, a, a more than 500 a years. That's a pretty good starting point for, so, for, for carbon sequestration. But on top of that, we also have the really nice feature that biochar actually really improves on the quality of the soil. It reduces soil density. That means that the roots can sort of spread out and get a grip. It also increases um, water retention so that you have a, a less, less of a need for irrigation. It also reduces the need for, uh, for nutrients. Again, something that improves, improves uh, crop outputs. So what we've chosen to do is actually take biochar, not onto lands that you might find out here around uh, Glasgow that are arable, where you can grow things and that are of good quality. No, we go for the worst possible soil you can find arid lands, so essentially we go for deserts. So what we're trying to do here is we apply biochar to deserts, and by doing so, we actually turn that into arable land, so land that can be farmed. And the cool thing, of course, is that if we do that, well, that is land that now produces residues. So, and those residues can, of course, be, be used by us. So again, just to recap, biochar is really the core of the concept here. We can produce uh, hydrogen in principle, we can produce electricity, we can produce biofuels, but the biochar is always a built-in feature of whatever we do. And that really has all of these nice benefits. This is actually a recent picture that we were taking, uh, had taken in India, where we're doing some soil studies in India, and now we're launching uh, together with, um, I think that was on the next slide, on the last slide, sorry, I forget. Um, with a, a company called Carbon Future and Klarna. We're now launching this platform uh, where we're starting to sell credits associated with putting the biochar into the soil. And that is not even counting the effects of the biochar increasing water retention and so forth. So what we're doing now is, of course, trying to achieve this goal of carbon negativity. And how are we doing on that? Let's see here. So this is a graph showing some of the, the usual suspects in the, uh, the green transition. And what we've taken the liberty of doing is saying, well, let's not, let's not compare technologies only based on the uh, cost to produce, let's say, a kilowatt hour of electricity. No, let's say that it has to be a CO2 negative kilowatt hour of electricity. Because again, that's where I started. This is what we need to actually achieve this uh, one and a half degree maximum uh, temperature increase. Well, so the cool thing about our platforms is that all of these other platforms, such as like geothermal, hydroelectric, uh, nuclear, and even uh, wind, they all have emissions associated with them. Like there's no such thing as zero if you don't have a sequestration element associated with it, at least not today. So they need to have an add-on feature, an add-on feature in the way of, let's say, sucking CO2 out of the air or doing something else to actually sequester the carbon associated with the production. We don't have that problem because our model, our technology has the carbon sequestration built into it. So that's why in terms of price, we are much, much uh, lower than uh, the competitors, in this case, these renewable resources that you've seen before. We also have the added feature that we're taking what essentially today at least is considered a waste product, a product and we're turning that into these valuable resources, so energy, uh, carbon sequestration, but also improved arable land. Okay, I think actually that is what I wanted to share with you today, and I look forward to seeing what you have uh, on the question front. Great stuff, Jacob. I mean, uh, you know, fascinating. Talk about the kind of the the, the, the triple line, um, well, it's not so much bottom line, but almost carbon line. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, first of all, before I can have a question. Any any uh, questions? Yeah, uh, Matt. Um, I was wondering. You talked about how the uh, the char is good for um, arid land. Um, on the land that is already cultiv um, can be cultivated, it, it, do you see a marked increase in the benefit in that type of land, or is it sort of marginal because it's already usable for for farming at the moment? 
Well, so, so that's a really good question because I think actually that gets to the core of one of the subtle, uh, really useful and smart things about the model that I presented you with here because a lot of companies are trying to also look into biochar. In fact, I think it's called the Future Forest Project here in Scotland. Uh, they're actually using biochar to pave the way for new indigenous forest uh, sort of establishment in Scotland, which is a you know, brilliant thing, uh, together with the Scottish government, I, th I think. Um, uh, but the issue is that if you already have kind of good land, it's a matchmaking uh, challenge. So it might be that biochar works, and it might be that it doesn't really do anything. So that's actually why we went for the worst possible land because tell you what, it'll always work. <laughs> like if you add it to a desert, nothing is going there. I can tell you it's gonna work. It's gonna have a positive effect. And also, that also gets us around a lot of these issues with uh, land use and displacement of, let's say, food crops and all that. Because the energy that we from MASH makes, that we will be producing, let's say, 10 years, 20 years from now, that is going to be produced from a crop residue that is coming from an area that today, so in 2021, was desert, right? And that means that we don't encroach on existing farmlands. We don't encroach on natural forest or anything like that. We don't encroach on existing habitats. Indeed, we increase biodiversity. We grow the biosphere. Um, I remember from your pitch, you talked about there was a weed in yeah. Kenya, was it, yeah, that, yeah. that was being used. So can you tell us about that? Because there's a Scotland has this partnership with Malawi, and I'm yeah, yeah. thinking along the banks of Lake Malawi. What, what, what? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so that's a good example. And, 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 and maybe just as, as a slight aside, a lot of you here, you have to promise me one thing, that when someone goes out and says biomass is bad, tell them the following. Biomass isn't just forest that has been chopped down in an unsustainable manner in, let's say, Western Africa. Biomass could also be an invasive plant species growing in Kenya. It could also be crop residues and things like that. And as a good example, we're actually working sort of a little bit sort of under the radar together with the UN, uh, UNDP actually, on um, figuring out how we could take invasive plant species in Kenya, something called Prosopis uliflora, and actually use that for doing soil remediation around refugee camps. So if we do that, what we're actually trying to do is create livelihoods for the local population because they could be the ones farming these lands that today are you know, unfarmable, right? And that's a good example of something that could definitely be utilized. I'm not, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Malawi is bordering on the Victoria Lake. Yes, right. Yes. So the Victoria Lake is completely infested with something called water hyacinth. It is, it is completely destroyed the biotope in uh, the, the lake and the livelihoods of the fishermen actually, uh, you know, you know uh, catching, uh, catching fish in the lake. So that can also be used for this exact purpose taking out the water hyacinth, getting back to the original biotope or the, and, and the, ensuring that biodiversity thrives in, in a lake like that. And, uh, sorry, does anyone have any questions? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Hi, can you, yeah. So I see a system as a system that consumes heat. I was wondering what will be a typical source of heat well, so, so the way that it works is that if you put a hydrocarbon, sorry, a hydrocarbon, so what I'm thinking, things like cellulose, lignin, the things that are in, well, pretty much anything, proteins, if you put that into our machine, what will happen is some of it, uh, typically around half of it, half of the carbon will go into the biochar. The rest of it will go into a gas. And then we can choose to do many exciting things about that gas. One, the easiest thing is to just burn it, right? That of burning it gives us the energy for the process. So that's sort of self-sustaining in that regard. But you can also uh, do some upgrading of it so they can actually start producing uh, hydrogen or even producing electricity from an internal combustion engine because you can put it in there. So there are many different interesting options you can do there. But the energy comes from the biomass itself. But when, when, you, when you talk about the units, how, what scale is it, is it container yeah, so size? We, we, have a, uh, we have a very, very simple, uh, simple principle in MatchMakes, which is we do the largest possible machine that will still fit in a 20-foot container. And that's because what you don't want to do is move around these resources. You don't want to move prosopis juliflora around. You don't want to move water hyacinth around. You want decentralized production of the energy products and the biochar because those are valuable commodities that you can then subsequently move around. You'd much rather move those commodities around than the ingoing uh, biomass feedstock or the residue. 
this is fascinating. And, and like all the companies, you know, we could chat for ages around this. Um, Jacob, thanks very much. And there's loads more we could ask, uh, but that's great for now. Um, thank you for thank you. Uh, being the, 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 um, ending the, the, the session of the presentations um, so well. We're going to have a, a short break, about sort of 10 minutes. Thank you.